Hello everybody. Hello. How are we doing? Good. I'm English. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. England. We own a piece of every country in the world. Except for America. So yeah, so I'm Ben Lovell. Yeah, so you can tweet me if you like. You can GitHub me. Uh, you can Google Plus me. <laughs> So Leon was talking about this whole social network thing, so, and this kind of dystopia. So what Google have done, they've made it fucking impossible for people to follow you. So all of the shit that you say is kind of to yourself, Leon, right? Problem solved. Yeah. I'm going to get so drunk tonight. <laughs> so that's not my GitHub timeline. That's a shower. So yeah, so look at me. Wow. <laughs> so I did actually, you can see probably like the middle picture, I did actually grow into these teeth and these ears, right? But the one on the left, fucking hell. <laughs> I have killed and I will kill again. <laughs> so I like to tell a few jokes. I like beards, uh, I like swearing. Um, I love my mum. Uh, my mum said a really funny thing to me the other day. She said, uh, Ben, you know, of all of, the, uh, all of your siblings, and I've got five brothers and one sister, so there is a fuck ton of us. So she's qualified to say this. She said, you're not the smartest one. <laughs> Fucking hell. She said, but you can make people laugh. So she said, you need to play on your skills, right? So I'm probably not going to teach you anything today. Um, well, I'll probably teach you one thing. Don't invite me to your conference to speak. <laughs> but anyway, so some of my interests include race, race driving. So that's me there in my car, driving around. You know, it's good fun. I'm not as good as DHH. Uh, you can see DHH there crashing his car. Um, <laughs> I was actually there at this race. And what you can't hear is, as he crashed, he went... He lifted his visor and went, oh my gosh! Yeah. So I'm a wizard at various programming languages. Visual Basic is fucking amazing. <laughs> you've, got, well, you've got the professional edition for the pros. You've got the enterprise edition for people that own suitcases and uh, briefcases. <laughs> it's, the it's the best. I fucking work for Microsoft. I'm the fucking best. This, this. Don't look at me like that. So I work for one minus one, and you're probably going to say, oh, why don't you call yourself zero? Well, I've heard that one a million times, so thanks. It's in Farnham, which is a place that none of you have ever heard of, and probably none of you are ever going to travel to, which I'd advise. Um, that's me. I like Star Wars, you know. I like pair programming. Um, Sometimes I have to take important business calls. Uh, but, you know, we deal with it. So, yeah, so, you know, I kind of miss... Uh, I've been travelling around. I've been uh, in the Philippines recently, which, is, which was really nice uh, and hot. And, you know, I kind of miss home. So I was kind of browsing around. I'm going to get to my talk in a minute, by the way. Sorry. This bit just gets me over the nerves. So I was kind of browsing around the internet looking for, like, Really nice kind of whimsical things that reminded me of home. So we've got some like interesting news going on back there. An example of either the supreme resilience of the windscreen or the lack of resilience of ornamental snails. It's like, fucking who writes this shit, man? <laughs> we've got ducks taking refuge from the rain on Friday. We've got fury over giant hedges. We've got seagulls fucking turning off TVs in Exeter. <laughs> The feathery bastards. And it started off this shit. First, student attacked by seagull, seagull attacked by student, angry seagull strike back. Which brings us on to building awesome JSON APIs. <laughs> I got your segues. I got your segues. Does it put segues? Oh, that, no, that, yeah. So there's a bunch of stuff I'm going to talk about today that's going to be interspersed between the jokes I tell. 
Um, so we've got Rails API, which is pretty awesome, and there's going to be a bunch of ranting there as well. And we've got JSON APIs, right? So like, you know, you're tool against bike shedding. You've got active model seri serializers because the JSON sucks. Yeah. What was that for? Yeah. Yeah, high five. We've got HTTP and REST because I'm going to need a REST in a minute. Oh, fuck. You're doing it wrong, maybe. We've got Etsy because there's going to be a bunch of shit that just cannot be categorized. And we've got unrelated pictures that remind me to take a break. <laughs> How are we doing? You're doing great. Mm. Have you learned anything? <laughs> Seagull and shit. Seagulls, yeah. Bastards. So there's, a, in my limited world view and perspective, being a Visual Basic programmer, there's some good components of, uh, some components of good API design. So they must be fast, which obviously Visual Basic kind of falls down on. Uh, they should be standardized, right? So you should kind of pick a standard and you should employ a standard because you don't want to be reinventing shit. Because there's always somebody smarter than you that's already invented something that you can just uh, blithely just steal. And they should be intuitive, right? Which, should, which means they should be kind of discoverable and they should be simple to use and they should be simple to reason about. And that brings us on to JSON API. So JSON API is like an emergent standard, right? So it's kind of like a work in progress. And one of the like, uh, kind of uh, aims of the project, if you like, or the aims of the standard, is to cut out the need for these. Bike shedding, right? So it's uh, actually an AI on a registered uh, uh, type. It's maintained by Haley Duff, uh, yeah, Haley Duff and Heath Ledger. Um, so this is really interesting. It's, you can get it on Git as well, and it's like one of those. It's a standard that you can contribute to as well. So these pictures, I'll get to these in a minute. So you, can you see that at the back? Yeah, that's the lyrics to a Michael Jackson song. Actually, no, it's not. So this is the this is the standard, right? So what you're going to see here, I won't go over it too much, but uh, what this portion here probably looks like is is uh, if you've written a JC, JSON API in the past, this is probably what it what it looks like, right? And the header section with the links is is kind of like the uh, hypermedia stuff, which I'll get into in a minute. Hmm. So that's the kind of the bottom section. So there's a bunch of things that the, the JSON API standard dictates, right? Um, and they're just mostly kind of common sense things uh, that you should try and employ to try and make your uh, APIs simple to consume. So you treat singular uh, resources the same as you treat resource collections, right? So they're kind of pluralized and nested within the, the name of the resource itself, right? You can, um, there's uh, too many relationships, of course, in this kind of style in the link section. There's very few keywords that the, the JSON API actually uh, reserves. Uh, links being one of them, ID being another, href, which we'll go into soon as well. So you've got this style of uh, relationships uh, you know, that links to the, the related resources via their IDs. And then you've got like the, the kind of the link style, right? Where you can uh, explode out uh, a URI which is like this, uh, this form of URI with expansion is an RFC uh, that I'll go into. You can expand that, those IDs out into the URIs to retrieve associated documents in the shorthand link style as well. So uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a quick story about the Queen of England. <laughs> yeah. So, so back in the day when I was a junior VB programmer, I got put onto a really important project, and one of the projects were uh, the, the project that I was put on was to actually move the uh, royal.gov.uk website over from uh, Unix, Linux environment, right, to Windows. Bearing in mind, I worked for a consultancy at the time that did ASP and stuff like that. And I was merrily working away on my API and a system which was a, a part of a CMS. One of the funky things about the royal family apart from their penchant to sleep with each other, is, um, is that they always have to have um, their obituaries in draft form, right? So you can guess what happens next. So I, I ship this feature, I go home for the weekend and have a little party with my friends, and then I get a page saying, Ben, Ben, there's been a problem. 
The Queen's been in touch. The Queen hasn't been in touch, really. She didn't really deal with support issues. She's got people doing that for her. The Queen's been in touch. She didn't get in touch, really. There's been a problem. What's this, then? The, the, the software that you shipped over the weekend, you've accidentally deployed all of the draft obituaries to the royal family. You killed them all. <laughs> so anyway, I did warn you that it was going to go a bit more. So back to JSON API. So you can express compound documents uh, because, or like kind of side-loaded documents, right? So you can side-load associated documents because the fastest form of HTTP is no HTTP at all. And this is a cool thing to provide to, for consumers of your API, right? Because you can't envision every possible uh, way that your API is going to be consumed, every possible way that those resources, documents, associated resources are going to be used, right? That's kind of the, the purpose of uh, giving out your API to the world. So the JSON API standard uh, specifies a way of including associated documents. So there's kind of three kinds, right? So you've got like the, the first level of associations, and you've got the associations of the associations, excuse me, and then you can include uh, unrelated documents as well. So like, you probably can't see this at the back, but this is kind of what the, those side-loaded documents look like. So they appear under a, a, a kind of named pluralized section in the JSON that's returned itself. You can see how actually like the ID uh, segments can be expanded into the hrefs of the associations there. And the JSON API standard dictates that you should, when you're sideloading or embedding associated resources in this kind of compound style, that you should always include the links section. So when you read the, the JSON API standard, um, it uses the same kind of RFC language, right? Like must, should, that kind of stuff, right? Um, if you want to try and make reading RFCs more interesting, you can, uh, you can swap things like should and must and stuff for just words of your choosing, really, like obvious troll, I don't know, LSD, that kind of shit. So we can, you can uh, provide the, the feature in an API. This isn't like a kind of prerequisite, if you like, but another cool thing that you can provide to consumers of your API is sparse field sets. So the consumers of your API can say, you know, I'm not interesting in, interested in this or interested in that. Uh, I just want these fields for this particular type of resource. Which is pretty cool and can cut down on some response, uh, potentially. So HTTP semantics, right? So there's a, also a bunch of stuff that I kind of neatly sidestepped around um, being a good uh, HTTP citizen. And the JSON API standard documents a bunch of this stuff, right? I found, I've, I've kind of happened upon, I can't remember where I first saw this, Twitter some, or something somewhere, probably wasn't Google Plus. Um, the MailChimp API, so like this, what this is supposed to illustrate, I mean, if you read it, uh, the MailChimp API is most, mostly RESTful, right? Yeah, great. Uh, known caveats, all API calls should be made with a post. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right on. What I did say in the first line that it was mostly RESTful, right? You can consider any non-200 response an error. Right on. Yeah. So like a 201 and stuff, you know. And the thing is here is like, try <laughs> What you don't want to do is surprise the consumers of your API, right? Like I know a bunch of you, you turned up today expecting to learn a bunch of stuff about APIs and I'm just telling jokes. So that was kind of a surprise, right? People that know me, it wouldn't have been a surprise. But with your APIs, you know, the, the consumers of your APIs are engineers, developers, uh, for the most part, you'd, you'd think. Don't surprise them, right? Stick to the kind of semantic forms that people are used to, right? The kind of the response codes and stuff, right? Yeah. You know, all that kind of stuff. This is just completely arbitrary, and I, I just wanted to put these pictures up. There's some cats and dogs and stuff, right? So that's the JSON API standard, a, a very kind of like whistle-stop tour of the JSON API standard. So then we've got Rails API. So Rails API, right? We love Ruby. We all love Ruby here, otherwise we wouldn't be here, right? Funny saying, Ruby, you might have heard this before as well, Ruby's not as slow as you might think. It's slower. 
And there is a mini troll there. So how do we make Ruby fast? Why you know make Ruby fast? By running less Ruby. It's obvious. So by that same token, how do we make Rails fast? You know what's coming, right? By running less Rails. So, yo dog, I heard you like Rails, so I took some Rails out of your Rails so you could Rails a bit faster than usual. <laughs> So the Rails API project is maintained by Haley Duff and Charlie Sheen. Uh, I'm really looking forward to Samuel Jackson's talk tomorrow. So let me fill you in on these. I'm not just a really horrible narcissistic bastard. There is this app called Alike on the App Store, which is like the probably either the most perfectly executed troll or the shittiest piece of software ever written. And remember, I work for Microsoft, so that's a big thing. So I would, I, would, I would encourage everybody to download this app and just take pictures of their friends and stuff. And the, some of the shit that it comes up with is just so funny, so funny. So anyway, right, so going back to this whole, like, I took some rails out of your rails so you could rails and other rails and stuff like that. So, like, rails is kind of like the kitchen sink, right? So rails by default loads a whole bunch of middlewares that in an API kind of environment, are just not useful to you, right? So like everything but the kitchen sink approach, right? I don't know if you understand that idiom. I mean, probably, yeah, you speak English. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, gosh, it's been a long day. So the, 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 the Rails API, what, what Rails API does is it cuts out a bunch of middlewares that just don't make sense in an API scenario, right? So you've got things like the cookies and the cookie store and the flash and a method override because you're not dealing with browsers. Um, so it's like anything but the kitchen sink. So that kind of trims Rails down to a certain degree, right? But Rails is still, is still pretty big. It's got a big surface area. So what you can actually do as well is like you'll see this um, that just kind of brings in the whole of the world when you, when you require Rails all. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you can choose not to do that and you can cut out a bunch of the Rail ties and thus kind of limiting the surface area of Rails even more, right? And there's a bunch of like, uh, these are all the controller modules um, that are dropped as well from the API. So there's like a whole bunch, oh, actually, that are available to you in the API scenario. So there's a, there, even there, I mean, there's probably a bunch of stuff that you, that you might not need to use, right? So, you know, if you don't use instrumentation, you can cut that out, thus limiting the surface area of the application uh, even more. And of course, you know, going back to that original point that, you know, how do you make uh, Ruby fast by running less Ruby? Um, you know, that could kind of like speed things up, make you a bit, power, bit more powerful. So there's no caption there. So I know what you're all thinking, right? So you're thinking, well, you know, surely like the ultimate expression of running the littlest Ruby possible in a kind of web uh, environment is using one of the uh, microservices, right? So like Sinatra and stuff like that. So, you know, why, why not use Sinatra? Sinatra is maintained by Michel Pfeiffer. <laughs> And Michelle Pfeiffer's bag. So is Michelle Pfeiffer around at all? Well, she's not. So I don't know if you heard this story about Constantine's bag, because it is Constantine that really maintains Sinatra. It's not Michelle Pfeiffer. Yeah, she, she prefers Node. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll just give you a quick story. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off the rails again. I'm going to talk, talk about Constantine's bag. So Mi Constantine and I just came back from... Uh, the Philippines, which is probably why I'm not making much sense right now. I'm kind of jet lagged. So what, uh, we landed in the Philippines and Constantine's bag didn't. So it kind of took a trip around the world, went into outer space. And Constantine's bag had quite a lot of fun while me and Constantine were in the Philippines. So <laughs> it, went, it, went to a, it went to a party. Hey, ladies. Got married. Had a honeymoon. Had a baby. It's like a little purse bag. Sorry, it's, if Constantine's not around, us, I'll apologise to him later. So anyway, so why do you not, why not use Sinatra? Why not use Grape? Why not use any of these like real honourable mentions like for these kind of micro frameworks, right? Because they're fast and they're nice. And one of the things that I've always thought is like, uh, and this quote probably sums it up. Sinatra is great when you're starting out. Um, 
you know, and things are actually small. But what happens is when you get to any kind of sizable application, you just start to reinvent all of the shit that's in Rails, right? So any sufficiently advanced Sinatra application is indistinguishable from Rails for the most part. And also, you know, we've got this. It's a wheel. It's round. It's nice. You know, it was, it was kind of discovered or invented a long, long time ago before most of us were alive. Um, and just don't reinvent it. There's no need. So moving on, so another part of the kind of whole like JSON API and the Rails API kind of uh, family, if you like, is active model serializers. So, you know, one of the things that you're going to be doing in, in an API, especially a JSON API, obviously, is marshalling JSON, right? So you're going to be going to JSON, from JSON, and essentially massaging hashes on the way in and on the way out, but primarily on the way out. And Active Model Serializers tries to kind of uh, conventionalize most of that and just kind of make it a bit more sane as well, right? So you've got like alternatives. So there's things like uh, JBuilder, which uses the kind of like the builder style, right? And I mean, I don't know about you, what you might think, but to me that looks kind of verbose and the meaning's kind of lost in there, right? Um, not to mention that so this is kind of part of the uh, the, the view pack, if you like, so you need all of the view stuff included in your Rails, and that kind of uh, flies against what I said originally about making Rails fast, right? So I don't know if any of you know this guy, what his name is. Anybody? It's Basecamp. <laughs> <laughs> he changed it recently. <laughs> if you call him DHH now, he gets really pissed. Maybe that's why he crashed his car. <laughs> I'm only joking. So yeah, so you know, like JBuilder is kind of like cool in itself, you know, and I'm not going to run it down. Um, but I prefer Active Model Serializers because they're conventional and because of a bunch of other things that I'm going to show you now. So you know, you add it to your gem file and you rouse GS Serializer and you pass it the name of the model or the, the kind of resource that you want to serialize, right? It's really simple to use. Um, you can specify the attributes that you want serialized into your response. You can specify associations. Um, you can configure the way that associations are serialized as well. So you can embed their IDs. You can embed them as full objects and stuff. It's pretty cool. Um, you've got a bunch of stuff available to you. Like you have things like uh, the uh, object here, which is like a reference to the actual instance of the thing that you're serializing. You've got scope that's uh, over there that's actually like, um, by default, it, it is like the context user, right? So it's like current underscore user. But you can uh, configure this. You can change it. It's pretty flexible. You can have kind of like virtual properties, if you like, as well, right? You can do a bunch of stuff in. Um, and what happens is, with Rails, um, when you like respond with the model instance, uh, or not just respond with, or when you like to render JSON with your model instance, Active model serializers are hooked in, and, they, and the serializer to be used will be inferred based on the type of the model. And again, this is kind of, you can override this behavior as well. So if you need to specify a different type of serializer, uh, a kind of singular serializer, if you like, or an array serializer, whatever, you know, you can knock yourself out with that. And one of the key things is, it's more kind of conventional, right? It's more based on conventions rather than this kind of big, verbose, like noisy feeling, you know, the, the intention gets lost within all of this huge amount of code kind of way of doing things. And it's pretty fast as well. Um, it went through a rewrite recently, which is probably never good for a project, but uh, like a complete ground up rewrite. And it came back pretty quick and it, it's nice. And I've used this in anger on, on uh, many projects and it's, it's pretty cool. And again, kind of going over old ground, uh, you don't need the kind of the whole like view stuff around, right? So it kind of makes your rails a bit quicker. But there are some issues with it, right? Because it makes it so simple to serialize associations and stuff. <coughs> you can do that. Um, you know, you're kind of merrily adding all of your associations. You're like, yeah, this is so cool. This is so liberating. And what you're actually doing is like Her Heroku. Heroku's on fire and, you know, like Amazon Web Services on fire and you're killing people left, right and center all in the name of uh, building APIs. 
So another thing, right? So kind of making your uh, APIs fast, right? You provide the ability for conditional gets, and of course, uh, Rails really makes this simple. And this is another one of those things like, sure, yeah, you can do it in Sinatra, and you can do it in um, any kind of, of the other microservices, but Rails being Rails gives you this really super nice and kind of simple syntax semantics for doing this kind of thing, which I'm sure you've all seen before, right? So, you know, you have this style and you have this respond with, and what Rails will do is it will, it, it will take your get request, and if the, uh, the cache key, it checks up on the cache key, checks up on the updated attribute of your model, determines with the headers, the last modified since, and that kind of stuff, and will kind of automatically turn that into a head request with uh, no modified status if it's not modified. And this is pretty cool because you can kind of cut out on unnecessary work. I mean, unfortunately, of course, um, you will need to do this active record stuff, you know, so you're going to need to go off and find your model instance. And, but for the most part, I guess, this kind of stuff's cached, or at least it should be. Um, this slide kind of just describes what I've just said, really. So this gets turned into the E tag and the, the last modified. These things get checked, and they get sent back on a known modified as well. Yeah, so active model serializers did actually have uh, caching built in. Um, and it was really super simple to use. I mean, of course, you know, cachings are, are, uh, can be particularly hard. And certainly on like determining what, the, what a, a value cache key would be for like, uh, especially uh, collections of resources. Unfortunately, that was removed recently. Um, and kind of like the reasoning of this is probably it doesn't really necessarily, um, I guess it's kind of like a muddled concern, right? This kind of stuff probably shouldn't live in your kind of like serialization uh, framework. Although that's probably kind of naturally where, roughly where it sits, it probably doesn't, it's probably quite a big problem to solve in a, just a simple serialization framework, right? So understandably that was removed and I'm think, I think that's gonna be added back in soon, but there's gonna be a whole bunch of talking and discussion about that first. So of course you can employ gateway caching, you know, so the kind of traditional like reverse proxy sort of style caching. And I hope you'll excuse me while I sidestep this shit. If you want to talk about this uh, later, come and find me when I'm drunk. So yeah, so hash rocket, right? So I promised I wouldn't do this, but uh, I'm going to do it anyway. So at lunchtime today, we were kind of sitting around a table. We were talking about hash rocket and hash rocket are really cool. And, you know, Thanks, HashRocket, for putting on the conference. And this is probably the last time I'm going to see all you guys because I know you're not going to invite me back next year. And, and uh, the, somebody was telling me that, you know, the HashRocket, they've got this house and, like, the Jacksonville Beach that they invite people to. I didn't get an invite, but, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. <laughs> and they go surfing, right? Surfing is so cool. I love surfing. What can happen to you when you're surfing? <laughs> Well, you know, statistically, well, actually, let, before I get on to that, so as long as <laughs> you're fine, right? You're fine as long as there is a recession. <laughs> so don't surf, like, with, yeah, don't surf with money in your pocket. Don't surf with designer clothes. Don't surf with money in your pockets, you know, yeah. Don't park the Bentley on the beach and stuff. Is, does Obi still work for Hashrocket? <laughs> so yeah, so anyway, back to the talk. So, so how, do you make these, how do you make your APIs testable, right? Or what kind of style of testing do you use with your APIs? So you can Google TDD failure, and before uh, the guy earlier came up for the number one result for TDD failure, I'm sure you would have seen my face. But no, I'm joking. So, you know, the good thing is with an API, right, so you kind of don't need to bring in that whole, like, view layer. You don't need to poke at, like, form fields and HTML. You don't need to use things like Capybara, which, you know, don't get me wrong, Capybara is awesome, but it just makes your tests super-duper slow. Um, so, you know, you can use rack test, right, and kind of when you're testing your APIs, like, what, you know, what, what are the proofs, right? What do you want to kind of... What's the contract that you provide to the consumers of your API? And it's kind of... Ultimately, like the response codes that you return, given a certain kind of bunch of values, right? So given a certain bunch of data uh, and against a certain URI, this is how we respond given these circumstances. And also like the describing the serialized response, right? Um, 
there's some things that you need to make sure uh, that you maintain, of course, compatibility for versioning. And I kind of didn't really talk about versioning very much because that could probably uh, equate to a whole talk in itself. I'll give you a simple piece of advice with versioning. Once you've built your API, don't ever change it. <laughs> Perfect, right? Uh, if you do need to change it, only make additive changes, which probably you could laugh at, but is, there's kind of some, uh, I guess, like, there's kind of some truth in that as well, right? So you can kind of ch change the behavior or introduce new behavior in an additive style without breaking backwards compatibility. And of course, your tests are really important for proving uh, backwards compatibility. So that kind of wraps us up, really. So that was kind of a whistle stop thing. So there was a bunch of stuff that I missed out. And you know, there's a bunch of stuff that I'd be more than happy to talk about people um, uh, with people tonight on the uh, pirate ship. Hopefully there won't be any sharks about because I'm probably going to get thrown over the edge. And that's kind of me. Thanks. <laughs>